delighted to have Victor Tedros here who will be giving a talk on uncertainties of war. Thanks very much. So, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, this uh, uh, talk is something which I think I'll probably get a lot more out of than you will. Uh, the, uh, an epistemology group is, uh, uh, an intimidating group has talked to me in one way of this because that's not my, my specialty. So I'm a, a, a more political and legal philosopher and not an epistemologist. But one of the difficult questions that people who work on just war theory or fossil fuel punishment or fossil criminal law face is what to do given the fact that when we inflict harm on other people or require to help other people, we're uncertain about the facts which seem like they're the morally most important facts. So most of the work that's done by the first order of moral philosophy, uh, by people like me, is um, uh, just assumes all the facts that we know all the facts and then tries to uh, draw conclusions from those facts by morally evaluating them and leaves the question of uncertainty aside. But we know, of course, that particularly in war, but also in other contexts, we're going to face the problem that often the most salient facts are ones which we are unsure about. So I thought, well, I'm going to try and think about that a bit. And so I wrote this paper just thinking about just part of that problem. So the part of the problem that I'm interested in uh, in this paper is uh, where the relevant facts are facts about liability. So let me just explain what uh, I mean by liability. So when you inflict harm on a person against their will, the person might be liable to that harm, and if they're liable to that harm, then when you inflict the harm on them, you don't wrong the person. And typically that's because they forfeited a right against being harmed. And we often think that people can forfeit rights by doing certain things which uh, make them responsible for some outcome or some threat or whatever, and then uh, as a result of that, they lost their rights. So for example, suppose that I threaten you with harm, the only way to prevent me from harming you is to harm me. We might think not only is it permissible for you to harm me, but also that if you harm me, you don't wrong me. Because I forfeited my right against being harmed to avert the threat because I'm responsible for the threat. So there are various facts that might contribute to liability. Some people think that you can only be liable if you forfeited your rights. I don't think that. I think you could sometimes be liable in other ways where you could have lost your rights through other kinds of uh, mechanisms. So you might be liable even if you're not responsible for posing a threat. You might think harming you sometimes to avert the threat doesn't wrong you too. So you have a definition of liability um, at the top of the handout. But you're liable to be harmed to some degree in order to avert some threat if inflicting the harm on you to avert the threat doesn't wrong you. And I don't say anything about how that comes about. You might think it's important the distinction between forfeiting rights and other ways of losing rights. So I do think that's going to be more important. We could distinguish different categories of liability to be a bit more precise there. But some of the cases that I'm going to talk about are cases where people aren't responsible for certain threats where I think we might want to say they're liable. So then the question is, what happens when we don't know the facts which we think make a person liable when those facts are true? So for example, if you think I'm liable for, um, to have harm inflicted on me to avert a threat if I'm responsible for posing the threat, then you might be uncertain about whether I'm responsible for posing a threat, or you might be uncertain whether the threat's actually there or not. And then what happens when that's true and we're uncertain about the relevant the relevant fact. That's our, uh, that's the topic of the, of the paper. Okay, so I'm just going to say a few preliminaries. So, um, I'm interested here in um, the probabilities of certain facts uh, being true. I'm interested in the epistemic probabilities rather than the objective ones. So. Um, the, the epistemic probabilities of the facts are uh, the assessment that the person ought to make in the light of the evidence that they have, not the assessment that they actually make. And then we really want to know ideally something about what it means to say that evidence is available to a person in the light of which then they should draw conclusions about the probability of some fact occurring. And I don't say anything about that in the paper, and that's a difficult question to just leave aside. Normally, 
when we think about what it's permissible to do in the light of certain evidence, we're interested in um, facts which, were we to know the truth, would be morally salient. So we need to know something about the fact relative world in order to say something about the evidence relative world. So we're interested in uncertainty about some facts, typically only if that fact would be morally salient were we to know whether it's obtained or not. So unfortunately that means that working on the uncertainty problem relies on making judgments about the moral salience of facts which are then going to be disputed by people with different moral views. But there's some things we might be able to say that are general and ecumenical with respect to the moral salience of certain facts. This is one very simple view that you might think um, is attractive, and I think some people are attracted to, uh, with, if they haven't thought about it too much. You might think something like, what we should do in the evidence relative uh, realm is to minimize the risk of acting wrongly. So we think, terrible thing to act wrongly. If I'm uncertain whether some act is going to act wrongly, then I will, uh, whether some act is going to be um, wrong in the fact relative sense, then it ought to minimize the risk of acting wrongly. So we can see that that view is mistaken by thinking about the well-known Miners case, which you've probably come across um, in uh, uh, utilitarian writing and, uh, and, a, and a range of other kinds of uh, topics as well. And in this case, uh, we've got two mine shafts, A and B. Um, they're about to be flooded with water. Ten miners are trapped down one of the shafts. We don't know which one. And we've got enough sandbags to block either shaft, A or B. And block A or block B, we can't block both. If we block A, then B will completely fill with water. If we block B, then A will completely fill with water. If we don't block either, then the water will go into, the, into both the shafts. If we block the shaft with the if we block the shaft with the miners in it, all the miners will be saved because all the water will go into the other shaft and the miners will drown. If we block the shaft without the miners in it, then all the water will go into the shaft with the miners in it and all the miners will drown. If we don't block either shaft, then the water will be divided between the two shafts and one miner will certainly be killed. We can suppose that's because there's one very short miner who's chained to the floor and the water will get above his head but not get up to the heads of the others, so that miner will drown, the others will be saved. Okay, so what would we do from the relative point, everyone's relative point of view? Well, we might think um, we should minimise the chance of us acting wrongly from the fact relative perspective, but that can't be right, because from the fact relative perspective, we ought to block the shaft with um, the miners in it, because that would save all of them. Um, if we don't block either shaft, then we're certainly acting wrongly from the fact relative point of view, because we're killing a person where we don't know all the facts. We would um, be morally required, I take it, to act in a way that would save all the miners. So we know when we refrain from blocking either shaft that we're acting wrongly from the fact relative point of view, and yet from the evidence relative point of view, that's clearly what we ought to do. So that shows, I think, that the view that says that we ought to try and minimise the probability of us acting wrongly is false. In this case, we're certainly acting wrongly. We can minimise the probability of us acting wrongly by blocking one of the two shafts, but that's obviously not what we ought to do from the evidence relative perspective. So we might then <coughs> say, well, what we ought to do is we ought to minimise the probability of acting wrongly from the fact relative point of view, waiting um, for the gravity of our wrongdoing. So that would, you might think, solve the problem because you might think, well, if we kill 10 miners, then we will um, do something which is very gravely wrong. So if we brought one of the two shafts, we've got a 50% chance of killing 10 miners, and killing 10 miners is very gravely wrong. Let's say it's 10 times as gravely wrong as killing one miner. So we've got a 50% chance of doing something that's 10 times as wrong, or a um, or, or the certainty of doing something that's a tenth as wrong. 
as the alternative. And so if we waited for the gravity of wrongdoing, we'd be able to solve our problem, wouldn't we? So we would just do the, we would then refrain from blocking the inner shaft because we would have a kind of expected moral value, moral wrongness value of 100% uh, times 1 rather than 50% times um, 10. And that would get the right result. But that turns out to be wrong as well. Um, so think about the case I call plane crash. So in this case, a plane is being flown as a building. There are fewer people in the building than there are passengers on the plane. But it's 99% certain that the terrorists have killed all of the passengers on the plane. If the passengers are still alive, then there's a good chance they're going to overcome the terrorists and land the plane safely. I can crash my plane into the plane and save the people in the building, but if I do this, then I sacrifice my life. Okay, so if I crash my plane into the plane, then there's a chance that I do something that's wrong from the fact relative point of view, because if the people on the plane are still alive, then I will have killed these people unnecessarily because they would otherwise overthrow the terrorists and land the plane safely. So what I do is wrong from the fact relative point of view. Yet it seems clearly permissible for me to crash my plane into the plane. And it certainly doesn't seem required for me to crash my plane into the plane because if I crash my plane into the plane, then I lose my life. So it's a supererogatory act. I think I'm not required to sacrifice my life for the sake of the people in the building. It's only a permission, it's not a requirement. So if I wanted to minimize the probability of me acting wrongly, even in the weighted sense, then I ought not to crash my plane into the plane, because then I wouldn't have done anything wrongly, because my, evidence relative, my, my, my agent relative permission not to crash the plane into the plane makes it not wrong for me to refrain from doing that, so the probability of zero that I act wrongly if I refrain from crashing my plane into the plane. And yet it still seems permissible, even though there's a chance that doing this will be wrong from the fact relative point of view. Okay, so I think we need to, I mean it may be that we should have a view that says we wait for wrongness, and then we have a way of accommodating the exception for agent relative um, permissions. But the simple view that says, um, do the thing that minimizes the probability of acting wrongly, weighted for the gravity of wrongness, um, that view turns out to be mistaken. We at least have to complicate the view. Okay. I've already gone over live with this, I'll leave that part of the paper at the start. Um, I do, if I was sketch, I'd do better work in the paper on it. So here's one um, issue that I think is going to further affect <coughs> what we ought to do from the evidence relative point of view. And this is going to be very important in the war context. So, um, the general uh, question um, that this section of the paper is interested in is uh, one concerning responsibility. So sometimes people are responsible for certain outcomes, threats, harm, and so on. Sometimes people are responsible for the conditions where other people are uncertain about the relevant facts. So you can be responsible for the evidence that's available to other people as well as being responsible for certain outcomes and so on. And if you think that responsibility for outcomes and threats and so on is responsible, you might also well think that responsibility for other people's um, evidential circumstances is important as well. And that's going to be important in the case of war. Consider Jeff McMahon's familiar view that a person renders herself liable to be um, harmed or killed to avert a threat only if that person is responsible for posing what he calls an objectively unjust threat or a fact relative unjust threat. So the threat has to be unjust and the person has to be responsible for posing it. So here's a forceful complaint that Seth Lazar mounts in a kind of extended review of Jeff's book in Forcing Public Affairs. He says, well, if you look at the actual facts about war, many people during war don't fire their weapons. They don't fire for psychological reasons. It turns out it's actually surprisingly different, difficult for human beings to bring themselves to kill other people. So when people go to war, some people are good at killing, most people balk at it, and so they just won't fire their weapons. Now, if you think that a person's only liable to avert a threat if they're responsible for creating the threat, then you think also that people are only liable if they in fact pose threats, but it turns out that a lot of combatants in war who are fighting on the unjust side of a war aren't responsible for posing any threats, they don't do anything. 
And so one response to this is to say, well, they do other things which contribute to threats. So they causally contribute by loading weapons and providing medical aid and so on. So let's just leave those questions aside. Let's suppose that these people aren't responsible for those things either. They raise difficult questions which we can leave aside for our purposes. Still, we might think in response to, so, so, so Lazar claims that McMahon's view effectively leads us to pacifism because we have good reasons to want to refrain from acting wrongly. Here are these people who are not liable. If we shoot a person where we can, we're almost always going to be uncertain whether they actually pose a threat or not, then we've got a high risk of acting wrongly from the fact relative point of view. We don't want to take these risks and therefore you ought not to shoot combatants, even ones who are clearly fighting on the unjust side because then they will not pose threats which contribute to the unjust side. Let's have a look at something like that. So, here's a response to that. We might, something, we might think something like this. The combatants who are on the unjust side who don't fire their weapons nevertheless don the uniforms of the unjust side and appear to be contributing to the unjust side. And let's suppose that they're volunteers, they've joined the war voluntarily and so on, and they're wrong to do so. So they could have avoided creating this difficult epistemic situation by just staying at home. So the reason why we find it difficult to discriminate between the, um, the ones who are going to fire and the ones that aren't is because we've got this large group of people some of whom are going to fire and some of whom aren't. And we might think the people who are members of the unjust side are responsible for the uncertainty. And that makes a difference, we might think, to the permissibility of harming them. So see the force of the idea, you might compare a case which I've got on the handout called Scream. So in Scream, uh, a serial killer's in town, he's been stabbing many people with a serrated knife wearing an Edward Munch Scream mask. You might notice the film ripped off my example. <laughs> so, um, X, in the example, dons a screen mask and carries a serrated knife, but doesn't oppose a threat to anyone. He's just doing this just for a laugh. I think it's fun to go around scaring people. And Y knows that X behaves in this way, so Y knows that X is going around with the screen mask and so on. So he comes across a person who's wearing a screen mask that appears to be about to stab a potential victim, B. And Y can shoot this person, but he's under, uncertain whether the person is the serial killer or is X. So is he permitted to shoot the person wearing the mask? On the assumption that there's no time to discover whether this is actually the serial killer or whether it's X. And in response to that, I think we might think something like, well, look, your ex could have just avoided creating this dilemma by refraining from donning the screen mask. So X is responsible for a situation where there's uncertainty about whether he poses a threat or not. And so X's complaint about being shot, in this case, is quite weak. So if it turns out to be the serial killer, the serial killer is liable. If it turns out to be X, then X is responsible for creating the appearance that he's the liable person, so we don't have too much sympathy. So no one who gets shot has a significant complaint against being shot, and so it's permissible to shoot. Might think something like that. And then we might want to know whether X is liable to be shot. And there's a bit of debate in the literature about this. So some people think that X is liable, and some people think that he isn't. So has X lost his right against being shot? So I don't think we need to answer that question. I think we can just um, say there's some features of liability that are present and some features that are absent. So the features that are present is that X's complaint seems significantly and significantly weaker in virtue of his responsibility for the uh, episodic situation of Y. So his complaint seems undermined by that fact. But on the other hand, something which is very important to liability is missing. So something especially regrettable about X being shot rather than the serial killer, because when we find out afterwards, we think, oh, we shot this person, and in fact, it was unnecessary to do so. And then if someone says, is he liable? We go, say, well, you know, there's a sense in which, and there's a sense in not which, we could use a word liability star, if you like, and just leave what I think is a verbal dispute aside.
Now, in, in the screen cases I've described it, if we shoot the person, if, if, if um, the person wearing the screen mask gets shot, then Y has a high chance of preventing a serious wrong. We might think that that's an important fact about the case. And there's quite a high chance that what Y has done is fact relative permissible or even fact relative required. Because you might think, were he to know that it was the serial killer, it would be required for him to shoot the person to protect the victim. I think that's a plausible view that it's morally required to shoot him. Or it has that. But it looks equally permissible, I think, to act in a case, or not equally, but almost equally permissible, to act in a case where he's certain that he's going to be act, act wrongly. So now imagine that there are two people here, both wearing screen masks, and both of the people have raised their knife towards Y. But we know that X isn't going to stab and the serial killer will stab. We don't know which one's which. Now is it permissible for Y to shoot both the serial killer and X, not knowing which one's which? So you're going to kill two people to save one. Right? So that looks bad. We might think it's still permissible to do it. His wife might still be permissible. We might think um, the, the uh, rights of the serial killer are clearly undermined because he's posing a threat unjustly, wrongly, and so on to the victim. So his, uh, the, the significance of his death is very, is, is very much discounted in virtue of the fact that he's culpably posed a threat. Now, if Y, if, 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 if X's behavior gives Y a decisive reason not to shoot, then through wearing the screen mask and raising the knife, Y has effectively condemned the victim to death, because now, um, sorry, X has effectively condemned the victim to death, because now Y can't shoot the two people, and so the life gets lost. So I think that his complaint is also very significantly undermined, because he could easily have avoided creating the conditions under which the victim's going to lose his life. So a principle which prohibits shooting in this case makes it true that X effectively costs the victim his life. So the principle which prohibits shooting makes it true that by donning this screen mask and pretending to be a serial killer, X costs the victim his life. And we might think that principle is objectionable for that reason. People shouldn't be able to create conditions under which people lose their lives like that. Otherwise, the person would have been protected, would not to have done this. Because he's done this, he can't be protected. So that make it, makes it permissible. And the fact that he's going to act fact relatively uh, wrong from the fact relative point of view is not in itself an objection, and we know that from the Wyler's case at the start. Right? That we, we've seen that sometimes acting in a way that's certainly wrong from the fact relative point of view is permissible, from the evidence relative point of view, so we shouldn't be troubled by that fact alone. So I think it's permissible, I think, in this case, to shoot both X and the serial killer, which one which. Okay, now the claim that there are important differences between the war case and the screen case, and fair enough. The case is a kind of toy and fair, the Cold War is uh, full of all sorts of complexities which might make important differences. One of the most important, you might think, is that when people go to war, they typically don't have the kinds of choices that are available to X, right? to simply stand and not wear the screen mask, no cost in that. Whereas when people go to war, on the other hand, they're subject to familiar kinds of difficulties which pressure them to go to war. They often act under duress, they uh, might be conscripted, they uh, act under peer pressure, they're very uncertain themselves about whether the war is just or not, they're not in a good position to evaluate whether the war is just, they come from poor social economic backgrounds, and that makes it difficult for them to evaluate the evidence, and so on. So I agree that those things make a difference. Um, I don't think they're going to make a decisive difference when the number of people, the number of combatants on the unjust side that get killed is significantly fewer than the number of lives that will be saved by the war. So imagine now a version of the screening case where you add lots and lots of victims. So you're going to kill a smaller number of screen mask wearers to save lots of victims. So I think these considerations are going to make a difference to the proportionality judgments, but I don't think they're going to yield pacifism. 
But you're going to make war more difficult to justify. You would, have, you would be able to get justify going to war, killing combatants, only if doing so would save maybe significantly more lives than we end up taking through the war. You might think that, given the responsibilities significantly undermined. But as long as those things are true, you might think it's permissible. And there's a difficult judgment to make when the numbers are equal. What should we say in that case? I'm tempted to say even in that case it's still permissible. Because even though the responsibility of combatants is weakened by the fact that I've just reverted to, I don't think it's completely undermined. Here's another one. You might think, well, the assessment that I've just given of screen yields a significant permission to kill non-combatants from the evidence relative point of view. So go back to the view that says that when you're liable to be killed, you're liable, your liability arises in virtue of being responsible for causing or posing an unjust threat. And there are plenty of non-combatants who do this. So you can contribute to the unjust threats in a war, for example, by paying taxes to the war which help to fund it, by building munitions in munitions plants, by providing medical assistance to those people who um, go out and fight, by providing food for them, by providing moral support, by voting in favour of the party that ends up causing the war, and so on. And we know lots of those acts during a war might well be wrong, contributing in those ways might be wrong. And some people think that if those causal connections are sufficiently strong, then the non-combatants who contribute in these ways are also liable to be killed. So we could kill people who work in munitions factories, some people think, in order to avert the threats that they contribute to by building weapons and so on. And now think about your average non-combatant, because your average civilian, where we're not sure whether they're making these contributions or not. So now you might think, well, given that we can kill these people in munitions factories, now we've got a bunch of people who well, they might be working in munitions factories or providing food or medical aid or whatever, can we mow them down as well? It looks like now the principle of non-combatant immunity looks like it's in serious trouble, and that looks like a, a challenge that we need to face. So one response is to say that we shouldn't be so wedded to the non-combatant immunity principle anyway. But the difference between combatants and non-combatants are not as profound as some just war theorists have claimed. So a lot of um, just war theorists, I think, take it as their task to justify or vindicate the common sense view that during a war it's okay to shoot combatants, but it's not okay to shoot non-combatants. I don't think we should think of that as the task of just war theory. I think the task of just war theory is to find out whether the difference between non-combatants and combatants is that profound. And if it turns out not to be, then we might want to give up the principle of non-combatant immunity. We might think that's an attractive principle for international law, but that doesn't mean that it's a really attractive fundamental moral principle, the principle that protects non-combatants. So my own view is that there are a range of other reasons why we should be troubled by the combatant-non-combatant uh, distinction. We should think it's as important as some people think, partly in virtue of the fact that it looks like what happens is that we get to recruit a load of combatants who get to sent off to war and mow down, and then we've got all these non-combatants who are safe, and it looks like they're sacrificing some people often from the poorest communities in order to protect the rest of us. And I don't think we should think that's such an attractive idea. So my own view, I defended this in a paper elsewhere, my own view is that um, we shouldn't be too troubled by the fact that if other conditions like proportionality get satisfied, we end up killing some non-combatants. Might be other reasons against killing them in certain ways, for example, terrorizing them and so on. Maybe those violate other kinds of moral prohibitions. But the mere fact that they're non-combatants in itself might not be the most important thing. Furthermore, I think that when non-combatants do create conditions of uncertainty and could avoid it, the intuition that it's permissible to kill these non-combatants is actually quite powerful. As a physicist, you check. In chips, 20 workers work in a lab that produces technology that assists the weapon systems of advanced fighter jets for the unjust side of the war. There's two groups of 10 workers, group A and group B. One group is working on real chips that will be used in the fighter jets. The other group is producing non-operational dummy chips that commanders on the unjust side intend to be secretly supplied to the enemy to confound their operations. X is a secret agent who works for the just side and he's infiltrated the lab. 
He's got an opportunity to kill Group A. He's discovered that the dummy chips will be supplied and informed his superiors. So if these dummy chips are supplied, they're just going to have no effect because the, the site will immediately be able to spot them as dummy chips. They won't have the relevant effects. So those people aren't, in fact, opposing any threat at all. They're not making a contribution to any threat. They're working on something that turns out, in fact, to be pointless. The other group, though, of course, is actually working in a way that will contribute to the threat. It really will make a difference in the final things. So X can't tell whether Group A is producing the real chips or the dummy chips. And this is no time to find out before the opportunity of killing Group A is lost. So the question is, is it permissible to kill Group A where he's uncertain whether they're contributing to the threat? So if he knew that Group A was producing real chips, then it looks like killing them is permissible because doing so is necessary to prevent them causally contributing to an unjust threat. Assuming that the threat's big enough and so on. X doesn't know that this um, group is producing, uh, the, uh, is contributing to the threat in this way, and that makes killing them, of course, more difficult to justify. But given that Group A, whoever they are, whether they're trying to produce the dummy chips or the real chips, is intending to contribute to the unjust threat, you might think that makes a significant difference to the permissibility of killing that group. If it turns out to be the group that's contributing to the unjust threat, they're liable to be killed through their of contributions. If it turns out to be the other group, their complaint is significantly weakened because they intend to participate in the activity which contributes to these unjust threats. Now, in fact, they're just like attempters. They're trying to participate, but they're, they're not going to be successful. But you might think attempting is enough to generate certain kinds of liability. I mean, often think attempting is enough to generate liability to punishment, after all. So why wouldn't we also think that attempting is enough to generate liability to offensive harm? In another paper, I have more of an option that attempting might be sufficient to generate some degree of liability. So I think that although it's more difficult to justify killing the group in virtue of the fact that we're not sure whether they're participating, if the numbers are going to stack up right, I don't think there's a very strict prohibition on killing. If you're going to kill the group of 10 people and you're going to save 20 lives, innocent lives in doing so, I think that the killing in that case might be permissible. We can also think about a variation on this case where X can kill both groups, just like in the screen case. And again, I think if the numbers stack up, that's going to be permissible too, even though you're certain of killing a group which is in fact making no confusion. Okay, so I don't think that the, the mere fact that these people are non-combatants is going to rule them out of being killed. I think that the difference between combatants and non-combatants when they're causally contributing might not be all that great. So I think the killing the group might be permissible. Okay. So in these cases that I've been discussing so far, the people who um, get killed either pose threats directly or they are responsible for creating the conditions of uncertainty. And given that one of these two things is true, I think that our prohibitions on killing people in, that, that, that might otherwise arise in virtue of the fact that we might well kill innocent people don't apply so profoundly. But what happens when people aren't so responsible? So now um, there are the conditions of uncertainty, we're uncertain whether we've got a group of people, some of them pose a threat, others of them don't pose a threat, and there's no responsibility on the ones that don't pose a threat, either for any cause or contributions to the threat or for the uncertainty. What should we say in those kinds of cases? Well, given that war, in, in the war context, responsibility is pretty pervasive, we're going to have to invent more fabulous hypothetical cases to evaluate the issue. So this is the part of the paper where I um, am less confident about what to say. What we're going to see is that when we think about these cases, we've got to think about the interaction between uncertainty and the significance of intentions to permissibility. And I'm just going to assume now that intentions make a difference to permissibility, but that's very controversial in the literature. Not everyone accepts that. So for example, Tim Scanlon, Francis Cam, Judith Thompson all think that intentions are irrelevant to permissibility. I'm just going to assume that intentions make a difference. It's harder to justify intentionally harming a person than it is harming a person as a side effect. Okay. So, here's a, 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 a kind of general case, and then I've got some variations on it. The general case is called Firing Squad. And it's uh, on the second page of your handout. 
So in, in firing squad, you've got a firing squad that's about to kill 10 innocent people. There's 10 men members of the firing squad who are indistinguishable. Eight members of the squad culpably pose a threat to the 10. So each member of the squad, if nothing is done, the ones that pose a threat, each of the eight, will kill all 10. So the deaths of the other 10 you might think of as overdetermined. So nothing's done, all eight will kill all 10, let's say, simultaneously. Two people have been hypnotized against their will to participate in the firing squad. And those that have been hypnotized also have unloaded weapons. So they're just additions to the firing squad. There's these, there's these two people on the end of the squad, um, let's say, or somewhere in the squad. We don't know which ones they are. They've been hypnotized and they also have unloaded weapons. They don't pose a threat. And they're also not responsible for creating the conditions where we're uncertain about who poses a threat and who isn't. What should we say about this case? Is it permissible to shoot the firing squad in order to protect the 10 innocent victims from being shot? In this case, we're going to shoot 10 people, and we're going to, if we do shoot 10 people, we'll certainly save 10 people. Eight of the people we might think of as liable to be killed, assuming you think that overdetermination doesn't undermine liability. The eight people we might think now are liable to be killed, but there's these two innocent hypnotized people who are not liable to be killed, and not only are they not liable because they're not responsible for creating the uncertainty, they're also not responsible because they're not posing any threat to anyone either, they're just bombs who've been flown in. Okay, so what's it permissible to do in this case where there's no responsibility? So you might think that intentional killing is very, very hard to justify. So if you think that intentions are relevant to permissibility, you might think, well, we're going to intentionally kill these people. Well, there might be different ways of killing the people, so let's think about the different ways. So let's first imagine that you can kill all of these people in secret, sequence, shooting them one at a time. So in order to kill them, you can only kill them one at a time now. So if I'm going to kill each person, I intentionally kill the person in front of me. Because I don't intentionally kill when I shoot person A, I don't intentionally kill a non-liable person, but that's part of the description of my intention. I intend the person I shoot, you might think, to have the fact that I make them liable. But I, I know that when I shoot all ten in sequence, then two of the people that I've intentionally shot will in fact be non-liable. So it's permissible to shoot the whole group. This is a little bit like, you might think, the punishment case, where in punishment we punish a whole group of people, and we know that some of those people that we punish are innocent. But it's a kind of closed case where we're, we're certain that there's members of the group that are, that are non-liable to punishment. So it's a, if anyone knows the kind of um, evidence literature here, it's a bit like the stadium case, where lots and lots of people have bought tickets for a, a football game, we know that 90%, let's say, or 95% of the people that have bought tickets have bought them on the black market normally, and so they're, um, they're guilty of fraud or whatever it is. And then there's the 5% who've built innocently. We don't know, with no way of distinguishing between the group, is it permissible to punish the whole lot? To which some people respond that it isn't. Okay. This is a bit like that, but it's in the self-defense rather than the punishment of contact, and that has some different features. So when we punish people, we're condemning them. You might think that's special, that's special, that's a sense of constraint on condemning people. In this case, we're just inflicting harm on them, we're not saying anything bad about them, we're not condemning them for being wrongdoers, we don't know whether they are or not. So maybe we don't have the epistemic warrant for condemning, but we do for killing them. Who knows? That's one sort of possibility to think about this one. Okay, so. Here's one reason why you might think it's permissible to kill these people even though we're going to kill some people intentionally who will in fact turn out to be non-liable. When we kill the group of people, we're not killing anyone as a means. Although we are killing people intentionally, we're not killing anyone as a means. And when we think about the significance of intentions, we might distinguish between those two kinds of intentions. So in the famous trolley case where you throw the fat man off the bridge in front of the trolley in order to save the fire, which many people think there's a stringent prohibition on doing that, one explanation is not just that you're intentionally harming the person, but you're harming them as a means to save the fire. But when we 
Shoot the people in the group. We're not harming them as a means. We're harming them in a way which we might call eliminative rather than manipulating them. And we can see this when we think about inanimate objects rather than people. So imagine that there's two boulders that are coming towards me. One of them is certainly going to crush me, and I don't know which one. But I know that one of them will. Let's say one of them is made of polystyrene, and one of them is a real heavy boulder, and I just can't tell the difference between them. So I destroy the two boulders. I don't think I destroy the polystyrene boulder as a means of protecting myself from the other boulder. I don't use the polystyrene boulder to protect myself. I intentionally destroy it, but I don't destroy it as a means. And we might think the same thing about the firing squad case. Well, I shoot all the people in a row, in sequence. I intentionally shoot some people, but I don't shoot those people as a means. I shoot them to eliminate the threat that they might pose. And many people think that there's a distinction between those different kinds of intentions. It's harder to justify using a person than it is to justify uh, harming them in a way that eliminates a threat. On the other hand, when I do harm the person, I know that I'm harming them without eliminating a threat that they in fact pose. I think they might pose a threat. Each person taking on their own, they might pose a threat. But I know that amongst the group, some of the people I harm don't pose a threat. So in this way, this case is different from standard non-responsible threat cases. So standard non-responsible threat cases, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the most famous is from Nosey, where you've got a fat man who gets thrown down a well to crush five people. In that case, the person who's thrown down the well directly poses a threat to the five. And we might think it's permissible to shoot that person in part because that person is causally responsible for the threat. They're not morally responsible for posing the threat, but they're causally responsible. Some people think that that's sufficient, so I'm not saying that it's right to say that's sufficient, but that's, that's a view that, 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 that's relatively prominent in the literature. Whereas these people in the group are kind of, you might think, causally responsible for the uncertainty, but they're not causally responsible for a threat. They're causally responsible, their presence makes the uncertainty occur, but they're not contributing to the threat. And I think that makes a difference easier, you might think, to justify a person to invert a threat that they in fact pose than it is one where they're just created an uncertainty. So that might make a difference. So there are some considerations, I think, in favour of the permission to shoot the people in the firing squad to save the ten. You might think harming two to save ten is permissible. Let's discount the eight to are liable. So then you think harming two to save ten as a side effect would be permissible. Harming two eliminatively to save ten would be permissible. If these were non-responsible threats, you can imagine two fat people thrown down a well to crush ten. You might think it's permissible to shoot the two to protect the ten if they're causally responsible for harming. Now the two are responsible for the uncertainty rather than for the threat. And that makes a difference, you might think, but you might think it doesn't make a decisive difference so it's permissible to kill the two. But I can imagine someone coming down on the other side in this case and saying it's impermissible to intentionally. Uh, in this case, it's on the borderline, it's hard to say. So I, it's a difficult case, I think. So let's take a case where you're intentionally killing in a, in a sequence. Okay, so now let's move to a case where there's a different way of killing the group. So let's suppose that in, like in Firing Squad 2, the pilot doesn't know who the innocent members of the Firing Squad are, but he's only got one big bomb. He can either obliterate the whole group or do nothing, rather than shooting in sequence. Okay, now some might think that Firing Squad 2 is just like Firing Squad 1. If the, pilots, um, if the pilot kills the members, of the firing squad one by one, he intentionally kills each person. If he drops the bomb in firing squad two, he intentionally kills the whole group. But some might doubt the conclusion. They might compare firing squad two to firing squad three. They might say, in firing squad, here's firing squad three. In firing squad two, it's just like firing squad two, but now the pilot knows that there's this group of people where he can see now that it's A and B, members of the group who've been hypnotized. So I suppose he can see the group, and the ones that have been hypnotized have got a big H on their heads, so we know who the hypnotized ones. And if he drops this bomb, he can either obliterate the group or refrain from dropping the bomb. Now, in the, in the Fire Squad 3 case, he might argue as follows. He might say, well, it's permissible for me to drop the bomb, because if I drop the bomb, I intend to kill the eight members, 
I know that the blast will certainly kill the two, but the two are just killed as a side effect. So I don't intend to kill the two, I only intend to kill the eight. And it's permissible to kill two people as a side effect of saving ten. We know that from the standard trolley case where you can divert a trolley from five to one. Assuming how the things that people think are already saving your point. I suppose that's right. Permissible to kill as a side effect two people to save ten. Here's a case where he does just kill two people as a side effect to save ten. It's true that he intentionally kills the eight, but the eight, lives of the eight are significantly discounted, maybe it's discounted to zero by the fact that they wrongly pose a threat to the innocents. So it's permissible in that case. Okay, now we go back to firing squad two. The point in firing squad two might reason like this. You might say, well, in firing squad three, it was permissible because he was just killing as a side effect. And the reason why it was permissible is because he knew that there were these two people, you might think, and that made it a side effect killing. And here I don't know these facts. I don't know who amongst the group are the innocent people. But that shouldn't make any difference, you might argue, because there's some facts. Some members of the group are hypnotized too. And whatever those facts are, it would be permissible for me to drop the bomb. So you imagine the, the ten people in our line, and it's the first two, it's if I knew it was the first two, it's permissible, if I knew it was the second two, it's permissible, if I knew it was the third two, it's permissible, whatever the facts are, it's permissible, were I to know those facts. And you might think, under those conditions, the mere fact that you don't know some facts is irrelevant. I should still be able to say, it's, if I could say it's killing as a side effect in firing squad three, I should also be able to say it's killing as a side effect in firing squad two, because whatever the relevant facts are, were I to know them, I would act permissively. So the fact that I don't know them can't make a difference. That's a tempting view, I think, about firing squad two. That there's no difference, more than the difference between firing squad two and firing squad three. Still, it might be objected that firing squad three is itself a case where you can't say that the person hasn't killed intentionally. Some people might doubt the view that says in firing squad three, where you know the two people are innocent, you can't really say it's firing squad three, okay. uh, 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 side effect. So compare firing squad four where there's a clear side effect case. So in the firing squad four, you've got the eight people in a row, you drop the bomb on the eight people, and then the shrapnel goes off as a side effect and kills two. That's a clear side effect case. But you might think obliterating a territory with a group of people in it isn't like that. All you can say in firing squad three, in contrast with firing squad four, is I intended to obliterate the group, including some innocent people and some guilty people, and you can't discriminate your intentions in the way that he wants to do in the argument in favour of killing himself firing in squad 3. You can't treat that like firing in squad 4. And here's further support for that, you might think. Think about this case. Um, uh, it's called individual obliteration. I don't think it's on your handout. Sorry, I should have included it. In individual obliteration, um, let's say Duncan's pointing a gun at you. And I've got a bomb and I throw it at Duncan and blow him up. <laughs> now imagine that, given Duncan's responsibility and my responsibility and the relevant difference in the harm that he did or whatever, it would be wrong intentionally to kill Duncan. And then imagine if I argued like this. When I throw the bomb at Duncan, I don't intend to kill him. The only thing I intended to obliterate was his trigger finger. Because obliterating his trigger finger would be sufficient to avert the threat that he poses for me. So when I throw the bomb, I know it's going to obliterate him, but all I intended to obliterate was the trigger finger. I didn't intend to kill him. I think we might be suspicious about that. We might think, you can't, when, when we think about our intentions, we can't find rain them in that way. It's a bit like when I crack an egg. So I crack an egg to get the, the, the yolk out. So I crack an egg on the side of a bowl. We can't say in that case, well, all I intended was to create the smallest hole that would get the yolk out. But I think that discriminates intentions too. That's, that's too fine grained of discrimination of our intentions. I intended to crack the egg, crack the whole thing, and not merely the smallest part that would be sufficient to get the yolk out. 
And we might think that firing squad three is like that. So firing squad three is like an intentional case, really. So we might then think that firing squad three is actually quite a lot like firing squad one, where you're shooting in order. You can't say that the person is just killing as a side effect, they actually are killing intentionally. And if that's right, then we should say the same thing about firing squad two. And we might then conclude that, given that we were troubled by firing squad one, as I was, I'm not sure whether it's permissible, then we should draw the same conclusion about this case, even if it's permissible to kill in firing squad four. Okay, so let me leave it there. And